Uh, you know, people refer to it as the golden era. And I think in those days, it was kind of like a transitional time. And I think that was a very cool time to be here. As things were growing, there was a real uh, close community feel to it. It wasn't as commercial maybe as it is now, where it seems like people are separated. But in those days, people knew people. And it was um, a very cool, old, rustic Hong Kong in a way. I lived in an old building, a red brick building. And it was a definite different time. But I loved it in those days. Well, actually, I came over from Taiwan. Before that, I was in Hawaii. So it was still, um, you know, a ride. Hong Kong was like in between Taiwan and the mainland, really. So there were elements of the mainland, which was more Chinese in certain ways and definitely more British in certain ways because it was British at the time. So it was a mixture. And I think that mixture was what was really important. Mixture of people, mixture of languages, mixture of things to do. The mix. Uh, well, commercial radio in those days, that was the station to listen to, actually. And it was on AM, and the people there were like disc jockeys. We were all disc jockeys. So there were people like, well, Mike Souza was the guy who hired me. He said, would you like to come to Hong Kong and work here after I was in Taiwan for a year? I went, yeah, okay, Hong Kong would be very cool. And I worked with people like Tony Orchez and Ashton Farley and Mike Mann and um, Jimbo and um, Felicity Stapley. Wow, I wonder what ever happened to her. But these were the people who were well known to not just the foreigners who lived in Hong Kong, but also to Chinese who lived in Hong Kong who really wanted to be a part of that English-speaking community. And that was their tie into the rest of the world. Uh, it felt more cosmopolitan than Taiwan and maybe the mainland, but I mean, for what it was, it was like Hong Kong was really the center of Asia and people knew that. I mean, I love the waterways, the waterways connected Hong Kong to the world and Hong Kong was that place that people wanted to go visit. It wasn't a really far off destination that people rarely spoke about. It was like, Hong Kong? Wow, you live in Hong Kong? And I think the feeling of living in Hong Kong was like that. It's like, I'm proud to be living in Hong Kong because it's such a central, it's the New York maybe of Asia in a way. Um, I just think that, you know, Hong Kong has a, had a reputation for being a cool place in Asia, but and not everybody knew what it was. I mean, in the States, it was like that, it's still a foreign country, a foreign area, and it had boats, and we thought it had like a, a mist every day, you know, like fog every day, and the, uh, the junks in the harbor. And, but other than that, people, I think, didn't know much about Hong Kong. Just like I didn't know much about Hong Kong. It took me a while to be here and get used to it and then realize it had a certain charm, a certain beauty, and it was unique. And I think maybe the unique part is the best part. Did people know anything about Chinese people who lived in Hong Kong? No. What people know in the States and maybe around the world is Chinese people from Hong Kong, they make good food. We like that. And that's about it. Maybe, maybe the fighting, the movies, they don't really watch the Bruce Lee movies, but they knew about it. They knew Jackie Chan movies, but they didn't know much. So really, there was a certain mystique about Hong Kong. Nightlife was um, definitely active. There were a lot of clubs against clubs. You know, they're like competitors. There was Canton Disco versus Hollywood East and uh, Hollywood. Boulevard and uh, the Manhattan and uh, there were definitely clubs disco disco so there was a um, it was a definite scene but I can't say that I was a real mix into that scene because I worked on radio a lot and if you talk to radio people they don't go you work with music every day and my work was to choose music and create programs 
so I don't want to listen to music at night. I want to break. But they were really, really popular. So there was a definite vibration, a vibe, as it were, to Hong Kong in those days. There was a certain music scene, but it was pretty localized because there wasn't like, um, I don't think there were any Hong Kong stars that made it internationally. Most of the people in those days, the Hong Kong, it was... Uh, definitely people doing music in Hong Kong, but it was for the Hong Kongese, and especially because it wasn't in Mandarin, so it was really in Cantonese. And those people were really quite famous um, in Hong Kong. But some of the people were really excellent, people that I looked up to, people like um, Anita Moy. And um, they were just so cool. You know, some of these people said, wow, they really could capture an audience. So the music was definitely prevalent, but... Um, but then there's other, they wanted to hear Hong Kong music, but people wanted to hear also Western music. And that's where I came in, being on the radio. I was the American on a British style station. So I kind of stood out a little bit and I was on in the nighttime when people could listen. It wasn't um, like in the middle of the day. And it was pretty nice to be part of the influential part of music in Hong Kong in those days. But I played... Western music. If you want to hear Chinese music, you listen to another station. But there was plenty of it. Uh, at that time, it was like we're talking about the Eagles and Elton John and the Beatles. And, uh, it was Western music, whatever was popular in the West. Also, you know, pop music, there was Wham. And you know, I'm just speaking from the top of my head. Uh, but the, let's say the 80s is when I was on the radio. I was on the radio from 1981 until 1995, the, uh, 1996. And I was on the radio continuously. So I was pretty much in touch with the audience and what they wanted to hear. And they wanted to hear pop music. They don't want to hear album cuts that nobody ever heard of. They want to hear what's the rest of the world listening to. So people wanted to hear pop music because the nature of pop music is it's popular. How do we connect to the rest of the world? Well, I mean, I'd worked in... Um, I had worked in radio in Hong Kong for 15 years also, and I was on the radio every day. Two different stations, commercial radio and uh, FM Select. And I was on TV every night for four years, video a day. So I would play music videos when they were really popular. Michael Jackson, George Michael, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and, and it was really kind of cool to be doing that. My job every day for four years was present a new music video. And it followed a really big program at night. So after that, it was 1996. And some people said, would you like to go to China to do a program called Joy FM? And it was on China Radio International and also Radio Shanghai. And it went to about 20 cities. I thought, and, you'll, and they said to me, you'll be the first foreigner to live in China and do a daily program for Chinese on a network and have millions of listeners. And I thought, well, that sounded appealing. I think I'll give it a try. And it was a bilingual program. Bilingual is much more important than just all English because we played like two thirds Western music and one third Chinese music. Uh, it was half spoken in Chinese, half spoken in English. So we could get a really large audience. And people still think of those days as the very cool days on radio because in those days, people listen to radio. These days, people do podcasts. Radio is for people driving a car. So it was an important time to be on the radio in China and be known as uh, a visitor to China. I wasn't there to prove anything. I was there just to show that we could do a friendly program between me and my co-host, which was my co-host my co -host was always female. We got along as two friends, and people heard this every day and thought, ah, oh, it's okay. So Westerners and Chinese can get along and do something together every night. So we gathered quite a big audience. I can tell you about this. I moved into two different, uh, maybe two or three different things. Um, I wrote an autobiography and from that autobiography, I took a chapter out and I've really been promoting that recently. And it's a story that a lot of, let's say half of China knows about a very famous writer. Her name is San Mao or her English name is Echo. And it happened that she's very famous. Half of China know who she is. Half of Chinese might know who she is around the world. 
So a long time ago, she was one of the most famous writers, and she wrote about her life. And everybody knows the story about her and her first husband, and they lived in the Sahara. And then he died in a diving accident. He was Spanish. But they don't know her last story, and I was the guy that she wrote that she was going to marry at the time of her death. And people go, wow, you knew Sanma? How did you meet? Where did you meet? What was she like? What happened at the end? At the end, two weeks before she died, she wrote to a guy to say, I'm going to marry O'Shea, which is my name. So it's a story that I still want to get to Chinese, and it hasn't been promoted enough. So I'm working on that, getting the story to people who really would like to know this story. And I created a project which is based on an image, and that image is good luck. And people in China know, there's a billion people in China, we all know, and especially in Hong Kong, we know that the number eight is good luck. So I created a character from the number eight, and I would like to see that on many, many, many products around the world, but it's got a cool part to it. It's got user-generated content where people can add their ideas to a basic design. So it's made for a much modern, a very modern society. It's not like, here's the image, accept it as it is. It's like, here's the image, let's dress it up, let's change it, but let's get this good luck image to people around the world because the world needs good luck. So I've got, it's called Babe. Ba means the number eight. So Babe, my story about San Mao, those are two projects that I'm working on. And I also do, um, I also did a, a thing recently. And that was very cool. It's called This is China. And I traveled with a film crew. We went to many places to interview many people. And there were people, some of them were people who started off very poor and they became very wealthy because they stayed with the projects they were doing. Like a guy who, is like one of the biggest producers of abalone in China. And also another guy is an oyster farmer. And then there's other people making wine and a whole variety of people. And to meet these people, to be on the road for two months, was really special. Because Chinese, as we know, are not really good at promoting themselves. And most people don't know much about Chinese. They know that they do Kung Fu fighting, they know about the movies. They have probably never seen the movies, but they know Chinese fight a lot and they make great food. But there's much more to more than a billion people in the world than just cooking food and doing Kung Fu movies.